Today's scripture is Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cassidy. And I had at least one congregant text me and say I was texting. So I think I, <laughs> I feel like I'm justified. It's okay. Good morning and welcome again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. We've been looking at the ramifications of the resurrection. And I think we've hit a problem. The problem is this, mainstream culture, the space that we swim in every day outside these walls, says this, he says, says, truth is relative, morals are human constructs that have just evolved for us to help survive, and yet the irony is this, of of, of that statement, (laughs) truth is a human construct, and morals are constructed as well, but unless you live precisely the way I define it, I'm going to cancel you. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That legalism, I think a lot of people thought years ago, oh, legalism is going to go away. But it hasn't. It hasn't died inside of moral relativity. Instead, just all you need to do is maybe what you're just doing, you can pop onto social media, and what you'll find there is people with such differ, differing certainties about how we're supposed to live, weaponizing that against each other. And so here's what happens is culture says this, you do you, just make sure you do it like me, or I'm going to cancel you. Right? It just, it's just, that's inconsistent. Our culture says develop your own moral values, like you should care for the poor at the same time. Like develop your own moral values, but unless you do it our way, care for the poor, um, love other people. Well, who says? Why? On whose authority? That's inconsistent. How do we get out of this contradiction? That we're on one level have this relative morality on another level we're said to actually supposed to care for and love and serve other people no matter what you believe i think this is something that we have to figure out no matter whether you are a a, a confirmed believer or somebody who doesn't know if they believe anything in between this is an issue for all of us what's going to allow us to not just have a moral feeling to care for other people how do we actually go to anybody else and say you too should care for the oppressed you too should care about these things culture has a problem but what our text shows us is Jesus does not. Let's look at this in three ways. We're going, to he- about, we're going to look at this with three headings. Hear the proclamation. See your need. Taste the assurance. See- hear the proclamation. See your need. Taste the assurance. So first, hear the proclamation. This is Jesus' first public act in the book of Luke. And as often happens when you do something first it kind of sets the tone it sets what you're going to be about and so what is that for him well he goes to a synagogue this is verse 16 the first verse in our text and it says that in verse 17 he found he, he asked for the scroll to come to him and he found a, the place where it's written in other words he handpicked this text and he takes a text that is Isaiah 61 it's the first few verses of Isaiah 61 he, ro- he reads it, rolls it up, and look at verse 20. It says, then he rolls up the scroll and gives it back to the attendant, which I think is kind of fun because the, you don't need to, Luke didn't need to throw that little extra bit in that he gave it back to the attendant, but it almost kind of slows down the narrative in slow motion, you know, because he hands it back. He sits down. It says everybody's eyes are on him. And he uses, it says this one phrase, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's like a one-line sermon. Some of you are like, I wish I had a one-line sermon. But um, by the way, it's not true. Look, verse 21 says he began. So actually there's a longer sermon there. But this is just the first line. But he says, 
in this first line, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, I know they didn't have microphones back then, but this is a mic drop to say that phrase like this. Because here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, that Messiah guy in Isaiah, that's me. I'm him. And if you read carefully in, this, in this, the passage quoted, you see three things that he's come to do. It's all in this word proclaim. Three times this word proclaim shows up. He's, I've come to proclaim the good news to the poor. I've come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now when I read that, and I read it a couple times this past couple weeks, something came out that I never saw before. I started going, thinking about it. Wait, 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 wait. What's more important? The actual salvation, the actual freedom, or the proclamation of that freedom? See, I think it's interesting that he says, no, I'm about the proclamation of that freedom. But if so, then he's saying, that's first priority. And so I want to play this out for you. Imagine that you lived years and years ago in a, a village, and you knew that there was an army that was coming to uh, um, destroy you. It was on its way. But you didn't know when it was actually going to show up. And so what ends up happening is, is that every single day, you're living in fear of when are they going to come? When are they going to show up? It doesn't matter anything else because that's looming over you. Now, let's say this. Let's say actually weeks ago that that army was defeated. But you didn't know about it. The village wasn't told about it. What happens is that you still live in fear. It doesn't matter if the war was actually won if you don't know about it. It's only when the herald comes into town and proclaims the truth. When you actually hear it, does your life actually change? You could do this in another way. Let's say you have a uh, medical procedure or, um, and, and they, take out a little, they do a biopsy or there's a scan and you're waiting for the results. You're trying to find out if you have cancer. Or does the treatment actually work? And so you're waiting and waiting and waiting to hear from the doctor. But it's only when the doctor proclaims the good news to you do you get relief. The statement, interestingly, the statement from the doctor doesn't actually make you healthy. It doesn't change your, your physical health. But the proclamation changes your reality. So in the same way, right after this text, Jesus goes and actually does heal the sick. He does uh, heal the blind. He does care for the poor. But what we see here is that he gives the proclamation first because what good is the power if you don't know about it? If you don't hear it, it can affect you. And so what we need to do is ask two questions at the same time based on this. Question number one is this. Have you heard the proclamation? Have you actually heard it? Not just cognitively, I don't mean intellectually. I mean, has this truth affected you? Does it change you? Do you live in light of it? Does it move you? Verse 21 says, this, uh, this, this, after he makes this proclamation, he says, this actually only becomes fulfilled in your hearing. Notice, in, the, in this moment, they didn't see bl a, a blind person being uh, given sight. They didn't see the prisoners being set free. But hearing the proclamation can actually change you. So we've asked ourselves, have we heard it? Because now you know that the war has been won. Now you know what the goal of life is. Now you know how history will play itself out, and that changes everything if you let it affect you. So question number one is, have you heard it? Now question number two is this. If Jesus has come to fix the wrongs of the world and heal the hurts, Please don't go like this. Please don't read this and go, oh man, that, gee golly, Jesus, what a swell guy. He's, just, he's not a moral relativist. He actually b does believe that, that you should love the poor and serve the poor and care about people. If that's all you get from this, then you're missing <laughs> the implication. Because the Greek verb that this is fulfilled in your hearing is actually in the perfect tense, which I know... Um, I wasn't really great at grammar in school, so I've had to like, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means this. A perfect tense is a completed action with an ongoing effect. 
in your hearing, with your hearing. It means that the ongoing effect of this reality happens through us. We participate in it as, in, as well. We participate in it too. So that means our job is to proclaim the good news as well. There, there's a lot of different ways to proclaim, of course, right? You can audibly proclaim. You can proclaim with your actions, with your posture, with your, your presence, what you do, how you do it, where you do it. But whatever it is, if this was Jesus' mission, you can't be a follower of Christ if this isn't your mission as well. Right? If Jesus preached good news to the poor, if I say I believe in Jesus, do I preach good news to the poor as well? That's the second question. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And it bends towards justice, why? Culture says, well, that's just, that's just the way life is, but that's, that's naive. Right? Just, if everything was randomly formed just the way it is, why does things just bend towards justice? That's not true. This is saying it bends towards justice because Jesus wills it. And the question is, is that our will as well? A lot of people say they believe in Jesus, but then they don't actually live out that belief in who he is and what he's come to do because we don't actually make it part of who we are too. Right? Your feelings will come and go. See, the problem is people go, well, I'll do it if I feel like it. But here's what I, this is what I learned about that. Um, when I had a, a messy room, my mom's like, clean up your room. I said, I don't feel like it. You know what she said? Tough cookies. It's moral obligation. doesn't matter what your moral feelings are. That's the same thing here. The moral obligation. Jesus could have picked any other text, but he picks this one because he's saying, if you want to be a follower of me, this is what I'm about. Will we proclaim good news to the poor? Will we proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? So we have to ask ourselves, is our life punctuated with it first? So question number one is, have we heard the proclamation? Question number two is, will we proclaim it as well? All right, first thing we see. Now, secondly, see your need. Some of you are going, oh, wow, okay, Mike's coming kind of in heavy today. <laughs> These are tough questions. Have you heard the proclamation? Do you proclaim it in the same way? What will allow us to do this? What will allow us to actually do, do these things? Well, I'll tell you what won't work. Shame. Shaming people into caring for the poor. I think the reason why our culture is moving the way it's moved is because as culture has become secular where we don't have a, a defined, agreed upon moral reality, we can't appeal to a universal truth and say, hey, we all agree with this, let's all do it. So what happens? Well, if you don't have a universal truth, the only other way to work is with the appeal to the masses to shame people into doing what we want. I think that's why we uh, have this sort of victimization culture that's, that's popped up because everybody wants to say they're the victim to appeal to the masses to get away from shame. But using shame, I just don't, I, I just don't think it's, it's going to work in the long run. And here's why. Here's how shame works. Shame works in one way like this. I don't want people to think less of me. I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm a bad person. And so I'm going to uh, show that I'm not selfish by living in line with what other people want from me. In other words, that's, that's fear, isn't it? I have to do this because I don't want to be shamed, so I'm going to live in fear of it. The other way that shame works is this way. Hey, I'm a good person. Those people are not the good people. I'm the good people, so I'm going to do things the right way. I'm going to, and, I, and you know what? Shame on them, but not shame on me. What's happening there? That, that's actually pride. And so, in other words, you can escape, you use shame. What we're doing is we're trying to use shame on people through the vehicles of fear and pride. Jonathan Edwards, who wrote a book called The Nature of True Virtue, says humans have always done this. We think we've evolved, right? Humans have always tried to use fear and pride to shame people into things. Right? I don't want to look bad. That's fear. I, 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 I'm better than them. That's pride. But think about it. Why do people not actually care for the poor? Why don't we actually move out and, and love and serve other people? You, I'll tell you one of the main things that go through my head when I have an opportunity. I go like this. I go, oh, I don't, I don't have the time. I, I don't have the time to do that. I'm sorry. 
What's happening there? When I say that, there's actually a fear laced in that statement because I have to put my time into other things because I'm afraid if I don't do the things that I need to do, then I'm going to miss out. There's a fear in that. What's the other way? How else do we get away from these things? Well, I say, hey, um, you know, I, I, I don't have, I'm kind of important, right? I have things to do. Like, that's for these other people to do it. These people do it. You do it. I, I can't do this. I have other things to do. What's going on there? That's pride. It's beneath me. I can't do it. What ends up happening then is this. We're trying to use shame through the vehicle of fear and pride to get people to do justice, to care for the poor and love other people. But the reason why we don't care for the poor and the reason why we don't do justice is because of fear and pride. You're going to actually, you can't, it does, it's not going to work. All you're going to do is increase fear and pride more. Or what I think what you're seeing a lot of people do is they just opt out. Or we just move into our little factions and we'll only hang out with the people who agree with our view. So th- via through tribalism, we actually escape the, actually, the shame that other people are trying to cast on us. Edward says this. He says, common virtue can restrain the heart, but it can't actually change the heart. That's not going to work. So then what does? Go to verse 18. If you go to verse 18, Jesus proclaims the good news to the poor. But then the, ne- the second phrase is he says, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Who's in prison? There's actually two groups here. You go, I don't, where are the two groups? Well, the first one, the more obvious one, that's also in, in the Isaiah passage, is the physically wrongfully incarcerated. There are people who are suffering wrongfully through our justice system. And Jesus says, I, I've come for them. You know why they, he's come for them? Because those people know they need a Savior. They know that uh, they can do nothing outside of his power and ability. See, the Bible is very clear that the people who come to Jesus most are the ones who are the most in need. The truth is, is you don't want grace unless you need grace. And you don't need grace if you feel pretty good about yourself. And I think there's a lot of the world that we're trying to, what we're trying to do is we're trying to feel pretty good about ourselves. Jesus is good news for the poor. He's good news for the blind. He's good news for you. But the oppressed and the physically poor and the physically incarcerated, the physically hurting, get this the most. They know their need. And that's what he's come for. That's the first group. But actually, there's a second group here. Because the Greek word for freedom here is the word for release. It's the word for freed from guilt or punishment. And in the book of Luke and in Acts, which the author Luke wrote as well, every single time that word is used... It's always about the forgiveness of sins. And this means there's a second layer on top of this one. That Jesus comes not just for the physically poor, he comes for the spiritually poor. He comes not just for the physically captive, he comes for the spiritually captive. How are you spiritually captive? Well, if you don't know that you're captive, you're captive. And a lot of people don't know that they're captive. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm here for everybody. If you're physically in need, come to him because... He's your Savior. But if you're spiritually in need, he'll come to him as well. See, I've I've done this job for seven years. The most stated phrase to me of need is this. I feel God's presence. I I believe in God, but I don't feel his presence. The second most stated statement I get is, I intellectually believe God is good. I just don't feel his goodness. You can only say those statements if the impact and the experience of God of his care and delight isn't fully known. You can only say those statements if you don't feel his care, if you don't feel the delight. And the reason why you don't feel it is because we don't really see our spiritual need. To do so, you must look on the inside and see that you have nothing to actually offer, nothing to bring. Most of us try to say, God, look what I have. I have this. I have, look, what I'm, look how awesome I am. Look how great I am. But when we say, God, I I believed in you, but my life isn't going the way I want, what's really happening there is you never believed in God for God. You believed in God for what you could get. Instead, we should say this, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. God, you owe me nothing, nothing I actually have that you need, so just save me. It's in that statement 
that you actually see your spiritual poverty, that you cry out a need that you can actually see what he's done. I've found when I feel most capable, when I feel like I have the least in need, I tend to be the, the most blind. It's when you have a posture of, I can't, but he can. I don't, but he does. I won't, but he will. That you can actually come to him and taste his grace. You can't will yourself to be good friends. You can't will somebody else to be good. But when you taste and see his goodness, that's when his presence becomes real. And when his presence becomes real to you, when it moves you, it can move us out. You won't want to proclaim this. That whole first point, you, there's no way you can answer those questions. You won't want to be a restorative presence for those in and around you if this doesn't mean anything to you first. And it only will if you see your need. Do you? I know it's counterintuitive. I know our culture is set up to, like, you know, not think about yourself, not do the introspection, put the headphones in, get on the subway. Don't think, just do. And Jesus is asking, this, this whole place is asking you, are you physically poor? Are you spiritually poor? Are you in need in the world? Are you in need in your heart? He's come for both. Now, thirdly, taste the assurance. You say assurance of what? Well, that he will make good on, this, on his proclamation. Remember I said, what good is it if you don't have the proclamation? Well, yeah, but you also need the salvation freedom as well. How do we know he's going to do that? Look at verse 19. He, there's this phrase. He tells us about the year of the Lord's favor. He's come, the last thing is he's going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But if you go to the Isaiah 61 passage, this fra- statement is in there, but it's in mid-sentence, and yet Jesus ends with it. So a lot of commentaries have, have spilled a lot of ink asking, well, why does he stop in the middle of it? Because if you keep going in the Isaiah 61 passage, it's, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the Lord's vengeance. Some people are like, ooh, Jesus is squishy with the vengeance word. He doesn't want that. No. He says, I've not, I've not come to, to drop any jot or tittle of scripture. He completely believes in the Lord's vengeance. But then why does he stop there? A lot of commentaries settle on this. They say it must mean that he wants to focus on the year of the Lord's favor. Even though everybody in that room would have known that this was mid-sentence, when he stops and says, today this scripture is fulfilled, what he's saying is, the year of the Lord's favor is now through Jesus. The judgment day is to come. And so he kind of bifurcates human history, that there's an already, there's a not yet, that there is, there is a, a salvation that's present now, and there's one that's to come as well. N.T. scholar, New York, uh, N.T. Wright says, um, Jesus is saying, between my first coming and my second coming, the, Lord, the year of the Lord's favor is now. And there's a process by which it comes. It's through the proclamation that goes out through everybody else, through you and me. And so we're to be generous because he's generous. We're to uh, forgive because he forgives. And this happens, I think, in two parts. Part one is this, the kingdom to come. Right, this is the second part. That you, we're not supposed to forget the future. Why shouldn't we forget the future? Here's why. What you believe about the future changes how you live now. If you believe that the future is random, that there is nothing, that it's just all going it, to, it's all for nothing, it inevitably af- affects how you live now. It affects how you operate. But if you believe the f- future is secure, if you know there's more, if you know that there's redemption and restoration for all of creation, that affects how you live now. Knowing one day it won't be this way. Knowing that the wrongs will be righted. Knowing that death and sadness doesn't win. Gives us power each day to come back and do something about it. Folks, there's a lot of crushing things out there. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of suffering. But what this is saying is, it doesn't have the last say. When you forgive each other's debts, when you serve, when you care for the needy in your community, when you seek to be a restorative presence, which we're seeking as a community, then you're part of the future breaking the now. Because we know if it's going to be assured, if we know it's going to happen, then we get a hand in it now. 
If the resurrection is true, then we have every reason in this world to rest in that. Why? You know what's interesting? When Jesus is resurrected, we didn't talk about this in Easter, but we can talk about it now. He still has the scars, doesn't he? Which makes me wonder, wait, is that, does that mean that, that means in the future, everything fixed doesn't mean everything is, is uh, like plastic. The hurts and the cares of the world will still, there'll be a, at least a representation of it. And I think what's happening there is, it's acknowledging that somehow the future, the pains and sorrows and hurts today, will be used to make the world beautiful in the future. That's the assurance. I don't know how, but somehow the things you're going through now will bring greater joy later. That means that the resurrection takes the bad things now, that what you've done, what you've not done, what's been done to you, what, 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 what's happening now, it turns it into glory. And what's coming becomes better. Guess what? If you knew that, guys, if, if that's not just pie in the sky. That's really, really true. What are we moping around for? What are we waiting around for? Don't give up. Don't turn around. Go further in. If your bad things are going to turn out for good, we have a powerful reason to go into each other's lives again and again and again. You know what happens? As you get older, this is, statistics show this. You, get less and, you, you have less and less friends. I, there's a lot of reasons for this probably. You, you're like, oh, I have to do this again. I don't want to do it again. You, you, you get tired. You opt out. If you knew that the assurance of the future is real. You can throw yourself back in. You can try again. You can reset again. Don't just intellectually believe this. Access it. Live it. Know that you have this. If you're going to eat and walk and hug and love then, then you can actually start doing that now. If you did, you would stop being so worried about what you're not getting in this life. And be thankful for what you actually have. That you could focus on not just your needs. You can focus on the needs of others. I think our biggest problem is we don't have the bandwidth because we can't focus on the other people out there because I'm so busy focusing in here. But if you knew that you actually have what you need, that you've already been taken care of cosmically, that can actually impact you locally. It can impact you physically. It can impact you literally out today. Nothing can keep you from Jesus no pain, no grief, no bullets or bombs or badness can keep you from the trumpet call of God. If we live in light of that, we're letting the future, the assurance that Jesus left out, but it was almost, it was a cliffhanger because he knew that it was to come, the kingdom's to come. Last part, second part of this, is the, fa- the year of the Lord's favor. What does that mean? The year of the Lord's favor means this, one word, Joy. Most of our lives are not marked with joy. You know, we just took a survey. I bet you if you gave your friends a survey to say, hey, I want you to tell me what you think. Anonymous, tell me what you think about me. I bet you joy is not in the top five. Some of you maybe. But that's actually, that, that would be a natural expression. How do we have real joy? Well, real joy, God's favor upon us is delight. And here's what's interesting about delight. Delight is not something that you can procure you can't fake it. You know what you can fake? You can fake a smile. Here's my fake smile. <laughs> Notice you can fake, you can fake laughter. I'm not going to try that. That's going to sound awkward. But you can't fake joy. Because when you, when you have joy, a heart filled with love, with joy, it kind of spills out. And it affects everyone and everything around you. Because if you delight in the Lord, you may, here's what you can do. You might not be a gifted parent, But if you have joy, if you have delight, the Lord will change your kid through that delight. I've been a lot of parents that aren't very gifted. They don't know the best. They don't know all the studies. They don't know what they're doing. But you know what they can do? Out of their delight, they can forgive and repent in front of their kids. That's a supernatural power. And when they forgive and repent in front of them, that changes them. But you can only do that if you have a delight in the Lord. An ungifted artist who delights in the joy. You might not get the accolades. You might not get the awards. But you know what you can, you know what you'll get? You'll be in demand to express joy because people will see it. I had a pastor, a mentor once. He was very disorganized. This guy's desk, I guess, although I've heard now that disorganized desk doesn't mean you have a disorganized life. Okay. But this guy was really disorganized. And he was not a great leader. And he had a lot of problems. But you know what he did? We, we, uh, 
who were being pastored by him, we couldn't, get a, we couldn't wait to get around him because he just had this delight and this wonder and this beauty, and we just wanted, it was infectious because of that. Delight in him and your love for him will spill out. And I guess how it'll spill out? It'll spill out in justice and service. You say, okay, yeah, okay, fine, Mike, thanks very much, but how, how can you delight? It's very simple. The way you delight is this. See his delight in you. You will delight in him to the degree that you see him delight in you, particularly when you see that he delights in you despite <laughs> what's not so delightful in you. When you see that he delights in you despite it all, then you will actually move out, not in guilt, but in grace. Not in fear, it's delight. And then we see why, because here's how it works. Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor so that we could become spiritually rich again. And that's how we move out and serve in love. Why? Because now there's no reason to despise anyone about their condition, whether they're physically or spiritually poor. Because if you have a deep knowledge of your own spiritual at least spiritual poverty. How can you despise anybody else's poverty? You're in the same boat. You actually will gravitate towards. You won't have the same reaction. See, the pro- a lot of people go, oh, well, I pulled myself up. Oh, I, look what I did. You know, why, you know, why can't they? There's probably a lot of reasons. But you know what? You're not going to despise. You're going to associate. You're going to see. You're not going to look at somebody and go, oh, they're too far away from understanding Jesus. You know why? Because <laughs> you look at yourself, you say, I had no natural understanding of Jesus. If you were a lost cause and came to him because of who Jesus is, then nobody else is a lost cause either. You can do for them as Jesus has done for you. That's not guilt. That's grace. Those who know of their spiritual poverty have, have no problem being around everyone else, no matter what their poverty is. I saw a video, last thing I'll say is this. I saw a video, um, I guess this is a little while ago, where... I think it was one of those people who were like a, I don't know, influencer online. They, they went to a retirement community and found some 85-year-old who could barely walk and said, guess what, I'm taking you to Disney World. All expenses paid. And, you know, of course, they had all the cameras and filming. And this guy was just so excited. He's on the mad teacups. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's 85, but his smile, it looks like he's 12. And at the end... The man's interviewed, and he says, I had so much joy. I've never been this happy. I, this is what he said. I thought my life was over. This is new life. Thank you so much. I'll remember this forever. Now, I think that person, we can question his kindness, because he was, he was trying to get us to watch, and I did. <laughs> but we could give joy to others because of the joy that's come to us without asking for more, without anybody necessarily seeing it. That's now our purpose in life. That we can move out in real care. People say, well, how can we move out in real care, right? Instead of shaming each other, we don't have to shame. We delight. Ask yourself, are there people who I can proclaim the Lord's favor to? Does the joy well up in me and does it overflow out? Where it doesn't feel like a chore, it just feels like care. We have that in him. Let it come out into us. Let that be our energy. You might be tired here. You might be um, sad. You might be in all kinds of different states, but we can sit here and let the delight in him move us out into others. Let's do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know I talk to people in all different spaces, whether they're believers or not believers, whether they have heavy hearts or light hearts. I pray that we would see that what you're calling us to is not some new moralism, not some new you should, you better, you're calling us to delight, only to delight in what, how you've delighted in us. You've called us to joy, the, 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 the year of the Lord's favor. Help us to see what that means. Help that that impact us. Let it move in our hearts and lives. And we would see if this is your care, this is the first sermon you preach, if this is what the core of who you are, I pray it would become powerfully who we are. I think we, we get ourselves all in a knot of doing too much, or how do I do anything, or where do I start? Help us just to look around in the spaces we're already in to be a restorative presence. As you've restored us, we can restore others. I pray that we do this now and always. 
Amen.